Welcome to Sabbath School, brought to you by It Is Written. We are taking a look at the book of Mark this quarter, and we are making our way through. In fact, this week we're on lesson number seven, and we're taking a look at teaching disciples. This is part one of two. We're glad to have you with us. Let's begin with prayer. Father, we wanna thank you for giving us the time, the opportunity, the ability to join you on this journey through the book of Mark. We ask that you would bless our time together and help our lives to be changed, impacted, transformed as we see the gospel through Mark's eyes. We ask that you'll bless our time together today and we thank you in Jesus' name, amen. Well, in addition to being glad that you are here with us, we're also glad that the author of this quarter's Sabbath School lesson is here with us as well. That's Thomas Shepard. He's the Senior Research Professor of New Testament at the Theological Seminary, Andrews University. Tom, welcome back again. Thank you, it's good to be here. So this is part one of two in Teaching Disciples. We're now in chapter eight of the book of Mark, moving sequentially through, mm -hmm. and there's a turning point in the book of Mark. Help us to understand this turning point. What do we turn from and to, and what is that pivot point? Okay, so uh, if you remember, I think from our first lesson, we talked about the Gospel of Mark divides into two halves fairly even. The first eight chapters are especially about uh, who is Jesus? The answer is he's the Messiah. The second half is where is he headed? He's headed to the cross. And of course, after that comes his resurrection. But those two ideas uh, are, are, are major dividing places in the book. So um, we're now arriving at the place where it's this dividing point where we're gonna say, where is Jesus going? But first, before where Jesus is going, we have to see um, that he prepares his disciples for this. So. Go ahead and read verses 27 to 30. Now Jesus and his disciples went out to the towns of Caesarea Philippi, and on the road he asked his disciples, saying to them, Who do men say that I am? So they answered, John the Baptist, but some say Elijah, and others one of the prophets. He said to them, But who do you say that I am? Peter answered and said to him, You are the Christ. Then he strictly warned them that they should tell no one about him. And okay, so we'll, we'll stop there at this point. Uh, this is the real turning place where Jesus asks his disciples, they've been with him now all this time, and he says, well, who do other people say that I am? And they all say John the Baptist, Elijah, one of the prophets, all insufficient uh, names or monikers for Jesus. He's not that, he's not John, he's not Elijah, he's not one of the prophets. And then the question comes to them straight, but who do you say I am? And Peter, speaking for the group says, you're the Messiah, you are the Christ. And uh, it surprises us that he strictly charges them to tell no one about him. But that again fits into this revelation secrecy motif that runs through the book. Uh, on a historical level, it's very clear that Jesus champs down saying that he's Messiah because people had the wrong expectation of what a Messiah would be. Um, and on a theological level, we have this back and forth between revelation and secrecy where uh, the real truth cannot be hidden. It's going to come out, see? So there's the secrecy, but it's, it's going to be revealed. And we'll see how that you know, shows up at the cross and at the resurrection of Jesus. So now we want to read verses 31 to 33 to see what's, what Jesus now proceeds to from that point. And he began to teach them that the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders and chief priests and scribes and be killed and after three days rise again. He spoke this word openly. Then Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. But when he had turned around and looked at his disciples, he rebuked Peter saying, Get behind me, Satan, for you are not mindful of the things of God, but the things of men. Okay, so immediately upon their understanding that he is the Messiah, now he starts to explain more of where he's headed. And it's rather shocking. He says he's gonna be rejected, he's gonna be killed, and after three days, he's gonna rise again. All right, so this, this is his what we call passion prediction. We call it the passion of Christ because passion comes from a word that means to, to suffer. And so he's, he's gonna suffer and he's gonna be killed 
and then he's going to rise again. Now, they just couldn't understand that. You know, he speaks plainly to them about this. So, um, you know, we might, we might say, well, well, why didn't he tell them that at first? <laughs> you know, and he didn't tell them that at first because they couldn't understand it. They couldn't accept it. They had to get to know him. They had to trust him. Uh, I remember the Gospel of John in chapter six, uh, when Jesus tells people they have to eat his flesh and drink his blood. Um, a lot of people don't, don't go with him anymore. He says to the disciples, are you gonna leave too? And they say, Lord, where would we go? You have the words of life. So he had to prepare them. They had to reach the place where they trusted him. And then he could explain to them the deep truth of where he was actually headed. So even here, once he's done that preparation, they're still having a hard time grasping this concept oh, yes. because it, it doesn't line up with where they think he's, he's going. And in fact, in, it, there's three passion predictions and each of them, they, they don't get it. They're, they're, they're in the dark still, yeah. And I think to some extent that can kind of happen to us if we get oh, yeah. our minds going in one direction, even if we read something very clear that's something different, uh, we have a tendency to make those same mistakes. So maybe we don't want to, to, uh, to treat them too harshly. No, no, um, no, agreed. Yeah. So what about this cost of discipleship? To follow Jesus, it's, it costs something. Yes. They, they were anticipating uh, glory and, and power and so forth, but, uh, but it's a little bit different. What is the cost of discipleship? Uh, there's a famous book that's written by a guy named Dietrich Bonhoeffer called The Cost of Discipleship. Uh, it's a pretty striking book. It's, uh, you know, hard hitting in terms of uh, where, where is your faith and what does it mean and what does it cost you to be a Christian. And uh, Jesus here, it's interesting in verse 34, he's, he calls the crowd. He doesn't just tell his disciples this. Calling the crowd to him with his disciples, he said to them, if anyone would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. Now, we have glorified the cross. We uh, put it on our churches. There's nothing wrong with that. It's a symbol of Christianity. It's become a symbol of Christianity. Uh, but it wasn't a symbol of Christianity in Jesus' day. It was the most ignominious, the most terrible way to die that the Romans used. They would uh, reserve this for criminals that were, you know, uh, re rebels against the uh, government and it was basically to shock all of the populace into uh, staying away from whatever got that guy on the cross. So if you were, you know, go, if, if you were to do this kind of thing, that's where you'll end up. Uh, it was a terrible way to die. It was not something that happened quickly. There was not much blood loss in uh, crucifixion. So a person could survive on the cross for days. They would be open to the elements, animals, insects. Um, they were commonly uh, crucified naked. It was, it was, nobody would want this, you see. So for Jesus to say this is, uh, is to utter deny, utterly deny yourself. That's what he says is the cost of discipleship. Um, and uh, so each of us has to ask the question, am I, a follower of Jesus. Am I truly a follower of Jesus? We, we make it too pretty sometimes. We make it too, too nice and too easy, I guess. Uh, we, don't, we don't always lay out, what does it really mean to follow Jesus? It means to deny yourself. It means to live for others. It means to be a blessing to others and not, not be selfish. So the, the cost of discipleship is very high, mm. exponentially high, almost ridiculously high. Yeah. But in order to, to choose that route, there must be some reward. Yeah, somebody, people would say, well, if that's what discipleship is, why would anybody want that? Exactly, so there's gotta be something positive to counterbalance that, uh, that cost of discipleship. Uh, what, is, what does Jesus say about the rewards of, of discipleship? All right, so let's read verses 35 through uh, the end of the chapter, verse 38. For whoever desires to save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake and the gospels will save it. For what will it profit a man if he gains the whole world and loses his own soul? Or what will a man give in exchange for his soul? 
For whoever is ashamed of me and my words in this adulterous and sinful generation, of him the Son of Man also will be ashamed when he comes in the glory of his Father with the holy angels. All right, so here's the topsy-turvy world. <laughs> and it's the paradox of Christianity. He says, whoever would save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake and the gospels will save it. So he had talked about denying oneself, but then he immediately uh, ends up describing what it is that uh, is going to give you value. You know, he, he talks about worth. You, you're, if you lose your life, you'll save it. What does it profit if you gain the whole world and forfeit your soul? Well, uh, you know, they say you can't take it with you. It is really true. You, you get these people who are extremely rich and they say, extend my life, doctor. The doctor says, well, I've done everything I can. You know, his money can't buy eternal life, you see. But following Jesus does. So what can a man give in return for his soul for whoever is ashamed of me and my words in this adulterous and sinful generation of him will the Son of Man be ashamed when he comes in the glory of his Father and the holy angels with the holy angels. So um, there's a glorious day coming when Jesus will return, not as a uh, crucified Savior, but as the conquering uh, Redeemer coming to redeem his people. So, you know, you have, to, you have to weigh it. Which is really worth more? Well, what's really worth more is eternal life with Jesus. So it's, um, I think it's John Eliot who said, um, a man is no fool who gives up that which he cannot keep to obtain that which he cannot lose. <laughs> and it's uh, you know, really the truth of Christianity. You give up what you can't keep anyways, but you gain that which you cannot lose, because, not because of you, but because of God's great promise. So a beautiful uh, pivot point, a, a shift mm -hmm. in the focus in, in the book of Mark. And this shift, I expect you probably talk a little bit more about in the companion book. Uh, that we have for yep. this quarter's book. Tell us a little bit more about what's, what's happening in this chapter of that book. Yeah, so again, it's the uh, companion book. If you wanna learn more than what the lesson quarterly says or what the teacher's lesson quarterly says, you get this book and uh, it talks about the cost of discipleship, describes it there. And then it goes on in this chapter to describe what happens in chapter nine, where Jesus meets a boy who's, uh, who is uh, demon possessed and how, how um, Jesus heals him. And then the, the, uh, the interesting ending of chapter nine about, uh, uh, we'll talk about that more in the next section maybe or in the next lesson, where we'll find out more about how chapter nine ends with the uh, healthy man in hell, so. So lots that you want to pick up on that will add more depth and breadth to your study of this, uh, of the book of Mark. Where can you find it? Very easily at itiswritten.shop, itiswritten.shop and you'll find the companion book to this quarter's Sabbath School lesson right there. We're gonna come back in just a moment as we continue looking at disciples. The Bible is filled with stories of flawed human beings God called to serve Him in incredible ways. He took a violent, impulsive, racist fisherman and transformed him into one of Jesus' closest disciples and one of the most influential leaders of the early church. Join me for another episode of our series, Great Characters of the Bible, as we look at the life of Peter. Peter was far from perfect. He was overly confident. He made promises he didn't keep. But his experience is an encouragement to anyone who knows the feeling of messing up as a follower of Jesus, of falling short, and wondering if you'll ever get it right. God stuck with Peter and helped him grow. And if you let him, he'll do the same for you. Great characters of the Bible. Peter, brought to you by It Is Written TV. Welcome back to Sabbath School, brought to you by It Is Written. We are on lesson number seven of 13. We're looking at making disciples. Uh, Tom, we, we get into here in, in chapter, end of chapter eight, chapter nine, we're heading into now, uh, the transfiguration. What's the significance of the transfiguration 
I, I mean, to suggest that it's insignificant would be foolish, but it is clearly significant. What are some elements of that significance that we need to make sure we grasp? Okay, so Jesus had just talked about at the end of chapter eight about the terrible cost of discipleship. You had to deny yourself, take up your cross and follow him. Then he talks about how valuable it is to be a Christian and that you know there's, there's this like eternal reward that you have from it. Now, he starts at the very beginning of chapter nine. This is in his next breath. He said to them, truly I say to you, there's some standing here who will not taste death until they see the kingdom of God after it has come with power. Now, immediately this raises a question in some people's mind. What, did, did, Jesus, did Jesus say that he was gonna come back in their generation and has that failed obviously that they have, he didn't come back then? So is the gospel not true? Well, no, that's not the case. He says, truly there are some standing here who will not taste death until, until they see the kingdom of God after it has come with power. Okay, so some means not everybody is going to uh, you know, see what is coming here, standing here who will not taste death until they see the kingdom come in power. So they're gonna taste death. Well, if they see the, come in, the kingdom come in power, how can, they, how, can they come, how can they taste death? You would expect that they would, that they would go to heaven with the Lord, you know? So what he's actually describing here, what he's predicting is this transfiguration. Now remember that he has just described that he was gonna to go to the cross. And so now he's gonna take three of his disciples up on a mountain, Peter, James, and John, leads up on a high mountain and he's transfigured before them. His clothes become, it says here, become radiant intensely white as no one on earth could bleach them. They had these people called fullers who would take and bleach clothes. And evidently they had pretty strong lye <laughs> that would really bleach it and make it, you know, really white. And he's like, no, but it's intensely more white than that. You know, it's shining white. He, he is there, appears to him, Elijah and Moses, and they're talking with Jesus and and Peter says, Rabbi, it's, it's good, verse, verse five of chapter nine, it's good that we are here. Let us make three tents, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. For he did not know what to say, for they were terrified. All right, so this, uh, this is transfiguration is where Jesus is now radiant. It's, it's like he's gonna, when he comes back the second time, he's gonna be radiant. Moses and Elijah are talking to him. Why these two? Well, these two show up interesting places together. They show up in the book of Revelation uh, and they show up here and uh, their uh, representatives, Moses died and was raised back to life as the book of Jude um, alludes to. And Elijah, of course, went to heaven without seeing death. So they represent two groups. One is the group, those who have died and will be raised back to life. Elijah, those who never face death, which would be really nice, you know, not to die, but to live until the Lord returns. And uh, this is a typical, what we call a typical theophany. There's this cloud that overshadows them, says God's voice, this is my beloved son, listen to him. And suddenly looking around, they no longer saw anyone with them, but Jesus only. I remember reading this in the book Desire of Ages, the beautiful chapter, The Transfiguration. She ends the chapter with this high note. And they looked around, and all, was, all was gone, and they were alone on the mountain with Jesus. You know, she's like, wow. You know, they just had this incredible experience, probably almost couldn't believe their eyes, couldn't, couldn't imagine, did that really happen? And then here they are all by themselves with Jesus. Uh, a most amazing experience. And when they're coming down the mountain, he tells them not to tell anybody about it. Well, again, it's that, it's that picture of um, the uh, secrecy and revelation. They just had the amazing theophany, the amazing appearance of God. Jesus is very clearly the heavenly son of God. And that's no doubt a encouragement to them when after he goes through the cross and their hopes are dashed, but they would have this memory that he was transfigured on that mountain. He really is the son of God. The son of God was crucified. Now, when he was crucified, they, I don't think they understood that. 
But eventually that memory came back and they could, they could put the two together, two plus two. So an incredible experience uh, that they saw, that they had a sight that they beheld. And then we come down not too many more verses and we run into, well, here's another uh, demoniac challenge, yeah. a demoniac problem, this, uh, this boy who's uh, with the, the mute spirit. Mm -hmm. um, why did Jesus take so long to deal with this boy? He, he could, he could per, you know, snap his proverbial fingers and, and fix things but it doesn't work that way. No, it doesn't. He comes down the mountain. The scribes are arguing with the nine disciples who were down below. They probably were quite kind of upset that they didn't get to go up on the mountain. You know, it's kind of like, you're not chosen. <laughs> you're like, why didn't they choose me? You know, when I used to play baseball, I was such a lousy baseball player as a little kid that I was like the person they chose last and put them out in right field where nobody would hit. So, you know, because I, I couldn't catch things real well and throw things real well. Uh, so it, you, you can understand how they might feel. And Jesus asked them, what are you arguing about with them? And the man says, the father speaks up, teacher, I brought my son to you for he has a spirit that makes him mute. And whenever it seizes him, it throws him down and he foams and grinds his teeth and becomes rigid. So I asked your disciples to cast it out and they were not able. Uh, it had to be discouraging. Jesus really, you know, he says, you faithless generation, how long am I to be with you? You know, he, it had to be kind of discouraging to him that, that they just never seemed to get it, you know, and they, 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 couldn't, uh, they couldn't do this. And they're, 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 they, they're gonna ask later on, why, why couldn't we cast it out, you know? But uh, he, um, bring, he says, bring the boy to me. So they, they bring the boy and the spirit convulses him, he falls down, he foams at the mouth, he becomes rich. I mean, it's this terrible demonstration. And uh, Jesus seems to take his time, you know. <laughs> he says, how long has it been happening to him? And the father describes all this trouble that he's had. And you, you think about this father, you know. He, he, he brought his, his boy was demon possessed. He brings him to where Jesus was. Jesus isn't here, he's up on the mountain, but we can, we can pray for your boy to be healed. They pray, the demon mocks him, he doesn't go out. The scribes come and start arguing with him and say, ah, oh, this is a spirit that you can't throw. I bet you Jesus can't throw him out either, you know? And so the disciples are like, oh my goodness, this is no good. Jesus comes down and then he takes all this time to ask the guy about it. So the man's faith just kind of withers. And he makes this really interesting statement. And he says, but if you can do anything, have compassion on us, and help us. And the Greek here is interesting. Jesus says, uh, the English translation says, if you can. Um, the Greek has, it's like, kind of like he's quoting the Father, the if you can, which is like, the real problem is if you can. So suddenly the Father realizes that his lack of faith could result in his son not being healed. And I think any parent can, can ponder that and think about that a moment and say, oh my goodness, I'm gonna be, the, it's my fault, you know. The problem, see here, wasn't just the demon possession. The problem was the lack of faith on the part of the father. So I like what the father says. He says, I believe, help my unbelief throws himself on Jesus' compassion. Anybody who comes to Jesus for help in the Gospels always gets it. So Jesus throws out the uh, demon and he cries out, comes out that people say he's dead, but Jesus lifts him up and um, you know everything's okay. They come into the house and the disciples ask him privately, why could we not cast it out? They've done it before. You know, they cast out demons before. He said to them, this kind cannot be driven out by anything but prayer. Now some manuscripts say prayer and fasting, but um, some just say anything but prayer. So um, they had let their, their hearts become filled with envy and that took the place of the power of God. So it's a good lesson, <laughs> good lesson for us. So Jesus stretched this one out, so among other things we could benefit from, from yeah, learning a little bit more You here. could say so, that uh, we, we, we get a, the benefit of their mistakes. That's right, that's right. <laughs> All right, latter part of 
chapter 9, Jesus sta starts talking about uh, cutting off hands and feet. Now, we hope he's not being literal here, hmm. but what is he talking about? All right, so if we go down to verse 43, again, we have to skip over a part of some of the, the passages, and we come to verse 43, and if your hand causes you to sin, cut it off. It is better for you to enter life crippled than with two hands to go to hell, to the unquenchable fire. And if your foot causes you to sin, cut it off. It is better for you to enter life lame than with two feet to be thrown into hell. And if your eye causes you to sin, tear it out. It is better for you to enter the kingdom of God with one eye than with two eyes to be thrown into hell. Whoa, you know, that, that's really powerful language. It, it, it's hyperbole, it's hyperbole. I'm a cellist and uh, I would not want to lose any of my hand, either hand or my fingers. You use the left hand to mo move the position and use the right hand to bow. And uh, that, that would be a bad thing to lose your hand or even a finger. Jesus says, it's worse to sin than it is to do that. Uh, the hyperbole is that you, you, know, you think that when you go to heaven, everything's gonna be all healed up and well. He's not telling you to cut off your hands, but he's like, you know, it'd be better to go in a hand, with one hand to go into heaven than to have both hands and be in hell. So this is the healthy man in hell. <laughs> you would expect the healthy people would be in heaven, but he said, no, it's the people who have you know, given up on sin. They've said, I'd rather lose a hand than sin. Boy, that's really something. So again, it's that high call of discipleship that he's put before us. So a beautiful coming together of ideas here at the very end. He says, what, what are your priorities? Mm -hmm. And I think he gives us a, a good idea to, to put our priorities in the right direction. Right. And we still have a little bit of uh, distance to go in the book of Mark. Still a few lessons that we're going to be looking at as we continue marching through the remainder of the book of Mark. And we're glad that you are joining us for this journey. Uh, again, if you happen to have missed any of our previous episodes, as we've covered chapters one through eight, you can find those at uh, itiswritten.tv or on our YouTube channel, a variety of other places as well. But there's much, much more. So make sure that you get caught up and don't miss any of the remaining episodes as we continue and in a few weeks finish our study of the book of Mark. But we hope it won't be the end of a study of the book of Mark for you. Hopefully, it'll just be the very beginning. Between now and then, we wish you the very best and we look forward to seeing you again next week here on Sabbath School brought to you by It Is Written.